Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Tortoise Thinking. Welcome to those of you who have joined us in the room here in Glasgow. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. My name is Giles Wittell. I'm an editor at Tortoise. We're delighted to be sharing this space with the New York Times. It is, without question, the grooviest space at COP. You can, if you're here, you can enjoy the oranges. And if you're right here, you can enjoy the greens off the screens as well. Um, and we're delighted also to be partnering for this session with Cat Gemini, which is a much bigger company than I thought. But we'll get to that. But it is relevant because um, today's topic is about leadership and specifically business leadership. And if you've been here for the nine or 10 days that COP's been going so far, depending on whether you start at Sunday or, or Monday, you'll know that you know a recurrent theme is what business's role in all this. Um, uh, government has, and leaders, climate envoys, John Kerry and others have almost literally come cap in hand. So there's, there's, there's the finance part of it, but, but also the leadership part of it. And our, um, our sort of framing question, talk is cheap, what should CEOs actually do about uh, the climate crisis, leads me very briefly to offer a confession or an apology. As I was walking back to Finiston, I feel like a local now, um, uh, from here <laughs> yesterday, uh, I was thinking that at the end of yesterday's session, uh, previewing this one, I said uh, that the question we'll be addressing is, is it enough just to set uh, net zero targets? Hint, no. And I thought in the drizzle, what do I know? I've never run a business. I have no idea if it's easy or hard to set the net zero target. I think we can be pretty uh, clear that it's, it's hard to keep one. Um, but there's a general sense leading up to COP and now that more, more is required, not least because most of these targets are set for mid-century, that's a long way off. They are easily fudged. And uh, the emergency is upon us and business is a part of the great sort of three-legged stool of government business consumers, which between them uh, have to solve this problem. So if more is required, what are we talking about? Are we talking about new forms of collaboration with partners, investors? Are we talking about getting ahead of government on, on regulation? Are we talking about retooling the company that you lead? Or are we talking, as Greta and others outside would have it, about retooling Capitalism. I'm not sure that one would expect that of, of a CEO in this system. Anyway, there's a great deal to get to. We've got some great guests who I'll introduce in just a second. A quick uh, mo um, note about thinkings. I think probably many of you will have um, been to one or dialed into one before, but the main thing is we want to hear from everybody, which is why periodically I'll be leaning forward, scrolling through the chat and being distracted. And I apologize for that. I'm an old man without half moon spectacles, so there'll be a bit of fumbling as well. But please, in the room, if, if there's something you want to say, raise your hand. We actually prefer to hear your views than to hear questions. If you have a question, go ahead. But if you want to hold forth, better still. And um, I hope that by the end of it, we, we will reach uh, a more informed point of view. And I personally, might have learned a little bit about whether it, I was being too flip about stating as a, as, a, as a matter of fact that setting a net zero target is, is easy. Without more ado, uh, let me come first. I'll introduce you as we come to you, to Rosemary Stark, who is group, uh, I can't read my own writing, uh, on the group executive committee at Captain Gemini and based up here in Scotland. Indeed, good morning. We had a chat before this session. And Rosemary, you were saying that, you know, apart from setting of targets, leaders, leaders have to set an example. And this is, when, when, we, when we talk about what else is required, it's partly about behavior. I don't want to steal your thunder. So tell us a bit more about what, what you mean by that. I, I think it's absolutely the case. Of course, targets, legislation, carbon pricing, all of these things are absolutely important. But working for a large company and as a leader in a large company, I, I really think it's important to dial up the influence. 
Well, we're a company of more than 310,000 people. If our strategy can be demonstrated in the behaviours of our leaders, then we can get all of our people involved, help influence their behaviours and help them influence in their circles of influence. And if you consider the people in this room or the companies present at the World Climate Summit, everyone doing that will mean millions and millions of people are influenced. And just a very simple example, in Captain and I, we have created something called Climate Circles. And the objective is to get everyone in the company talking about the effects of climate change, thinking about what we can do differently on it, and thinking about how we can help our clients to really do something positive on addressing climate change. And that's a good example of what I mean by um, dialing up the influence. Right. So there's a bit of a multiplier effect um, through employees, through clients, but what if, what if the pressure is coming the other way? I mean, I suppose are climate circles uh, intended to function also as a channel for employees to pressure leadership? Absolutely, yes. And that's the whole idea, right. to really make fundamental change happen. It can't just come from the government or the top down in organisations. It really has to embrace the requirement of citizens, employees, team members, business partners to want to collaborate on that change. And, you know, we, we're committed to helping our clients save more than 10 million tonnes of carbon emissions between now and 2030. That's about 20 times our own carbon footprint because we recognise that as a services company, the difference that we can make on our own perimeter is quite small in comparison right. to how we can amplify that with clients. And I was just saying to Fiona, I drive an electric vehicle and, I, you know, my... Um, but you don't lease it from her? <laughs> no, not yet. Maybe next time. Um, Maybe she'll make you an offer. I'm sure she will, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and I, I just feel every time I can talk to someone about this EV or I can give them a ride in the EV, if it helps them um, be influenced to make their next purchase or their next lease an EV, in my own way, I'm helping. And I think it's what we do personally, in addition to what we might do from strategically as a business, that really does this amplification of change. Right. Well, I'd certainly like to come back to sort of how that works in practice. But first, let me pick you up on this figure. 10... Uh, megatons of CO2 equivalent by 2030 is what you as a company have set out to help clients achieve. And this comes back to the point about setting targets. Is it meaningful? Is it hard or, or is it easy? Uh, I think there's a degree of skepticism out there about targets, right? Um, and the premise that you can just go ahead and set them and hope that people don't notice whether you keep them. What what is the reality, though, if you're sitting in a leadership position in a company and you make that kind of a pledge? Are you assuming that you will be held to it? Absolutely. 10 million tons is what we're committed to. And we are absolutely expect to be challenged, audited, right. whatever, on making that. And I, I think any organisation that really is genuinely interested in committing to helping us avert climate disaster will be happy to be held accountable to its targets. And certainly any PLC with a board and mm. shareholders will absolutely expect to be demonstrating how it's made its commitments. Okay, board, shareholders, um, but then you've also got um, em employees, press. Who, who is really uh, the key player in terms of uh, um, sort of enforcing accountability here? Well, obviously, we have um, we have an ESG policy right. and approach, which is fully audited. We have our head of sustainability, James Roby, in the audience here today. And it's like every other commitment that we make as a firm. We would expect to be able to demonstrate how we've gone from the strategy to the plan, what actions we're taking and what the demonstrable results is. Right. Ultimately, whether you have a strategy for net zero or not, what really matters is the results. Right, right. One thing that I think we should try to get into possibly is I can quite see how this is all, the transparency is sort of mandatory and, and real and enforceable for a big visible company. But I'd be interested to know if people think that it's murkier for SMEs. 
anyway, we'll come to that. L let me come next to Fiona. Fiona Howarth is CEO of Octopus Electric Vehicles. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you, again, we, we had a sort of cheap conversation before this. And would I be right in thinking that you view the whole thing slightly differently as an opportunity rather than a challenge? I mean, you would, wouldn't you? You're in that business. But tell us more about that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, there was two words on my way here that I was thinking about. One was engage, and that was around customers and clients and employees and things. And so we can come back to that very similar to, to Rosemary. But actually embrace. So it's really embrace this change. If you think about digital, right? We all have been through this huge transition where now we order a bunch of our stuff online, it gets delivered to our doors, we no longer go into the store in the same way or the department store, whatever it might be. Net zero is a similarly huge change. And if you think about the winners in the transformation to digital, the winners in the net zero transition are going to be the ones that embrace it. So if we look at the auto sector, for example, I mean, Tesla's like the obvious example there, right? Absolutely leading the change, phenomenally high uh, share price now and then if you look at some of the others we like talk talk as if you know don't don't have your kodak moment <laughs> you know if you take, take kodak they really didn't embrace that change they didn't embrace that change to digital technology in terms of taking photos and i mean do you know i i said this on a podcast recently and uh it was with robert llewellyn who does fully charged in, in the ev space for your interesting evs check him out on on youtube and he's, he's a red he was an actor in red wolf Anyway, he, um, he was an actual Red Dwarf. He was an actor in Red Dwarf. Sorry, right. He was Crichton. <laughs> Do you remember Crichton, the robot? Deaf as well as blind. I mean, sorry. Red Dwarf, <laughs> I, that would be amazing. But um, no, he, but he, he, he's like, we've got to explain to the audience what you mean by a Kodak moment. Hmm. Yeah. Because there's a bunch of the generation, you know, the newer generation don't even know who Kodak were. Yeah. And that's the point. It's like, you know, let's not have the, you know, a similar situation with the car manufacturers. And, and some of them are going to struggle. Some of them are late to adopt the change. And actually, it's going to happen across lots of different things. So it's not just how we move from A to B. It's not it's going to be how we heat our homes. It's going to be what we eat. And actually, if you take the new generation as well, I was, I was looking at the stats on the way here. 60% of young people aged between 16 and 25, this research was, across 10,000 young people, 60% of them are worried or extremely worried about climate change. They are desperate to adopt new behaviors and work for companies that are absolutely living in this kind of purpose-driven world to make the world a better place. And so actually to hire good people, mm. not just to sell the right products in, in the new world, but just everything, you're just gonna have to adopt it and embrace it. And the faster we go, the faster, it, the better it is for everyone. But Fiona, take a step back from the what I would say fortunate position in which you find yourself because you are obviously um, you are having a, a sort of mini Tesla moment right uh, not a Kodak moment <laughs> but um, but if you are in if you were in a business that was having to turn on a dime uh, transition to being a different sort of business and we talk about them and with them all the time we know who they are they're very big, we depend on them. Um, uh, then embrace sounds good, but in terms of day-to-day -day decision making as, a, as an executive, mm. um, it's, it's much more complicated than that, isn't it? I mean, what, what, what would your key uh, pieces of advice be to a counterpart in, 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 in VW? Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. Well, so, so I think it's actually slightly different skill set than running a, a huge corporate actually. Right. So uh, I'll give you a different example, which is I used to work at British Gas. Right. I actually worked in the Hive team at British Gas. And Sorry, what's that? Hive, where you can control your heating from your mobile phone. Okay. And it was a kind of startup, it's a connected mm. homes business. You can, um, and it was a startup within this big organization. And we used to talk about it as the speedboat next to the big tanker. Because a big corporate is this slow moving, relatively slow moving entity. And you're making big decisions that have big impacts throughout the whole business. And typically a big corporate's kind of role is to optimize and kind of take cost out and iterate you know, around that kind of core product market fit that they found probably years ago. Whereas actually this, this new world is around testing things, iterating, developing, failing fast, 
And it's a different mindset. So actually what we did with the Connected Homes business, it was we started a new business separate to the big entity, but we still took some of the key experience and the people within reason and benefited from some of the big, uh, you know, the big entity alongside the big parent company, but had the remit to go and play <laughs> essentially and try out different stuff. And actually Hive is now in, I think nearly 2 million homes across the UK and is helping people save money and energy through their heating and is and is cool tech you know it's a it's saving gas it's saving gas it's, it's a good thing for the environment as well and it enabled them to have this startup entity so those big corporates yeah you need to keep doing some of that stuff but how are you embracing this new world with people that are testing and iterating and, and creating your products of the future but are you saying that by nurturing the startup the big corporate is is making it easier for itself the super tanker to turn for sure into it absolutely and what you typically find is you end up with that new new world uh finding new ways of doing things and then you scale quickly into those new way of doing things that work right so in fact you might by the way have a few startups in different spaces right so it might be you might have, you know the example of the connected homes one is not a bad one but you might also have something in EVs, you might, you know, depending on what it might be, there might be a tech one in terms of uh, yeah, optimizing EV charging, for example. There could be all sorts of things that you might be playing with. The VW example, for example, they might be making new battery technology. They might be looking at the supply chain because the supply chain is going to be a challenge. But what about actually how you charge it up and how you optimize that with the grid? There's a huge amount of opportunity <laughs> in this space that they could be getting involved with, which is the future of that market. And if they don't, if they don't look to that right now, I mean, they, they'll be late to the game, arguably are already. Yeah, that'd be fascinating to see. Um, there's certainly, um, and we will find out more about that tomorrow when uh, we have a session on this with a representative from VW. Um, I want to come to David Blood now, if I can. David's dialing in, um, uh, is a founding partner of Generation Investment Management. David, hello. Thanks for joining us. Good um, morning. Um, can I invite you maybe to respond to what you've heard so far, but also to this um, sophomoric uh, uh, opinion on, on business. Again, I was thinking it last night. Of the three uh, big constituencies in this debate, government, business, and uh, consumers, isn't it in fact the case that the overwhelming uh, burden of responsibility on leadership in the climate crisis should be on the first and the third? That's what governments are for, to solve problems. Consumers, individuals have a responsibility to, to make decisions about their own lives. Businesses have a responsibility to make payroll and grow and serve their shareholders. I'm being uh, slightly devil's advocate at this point, but since, since our, our subject now is, is, is what is the role of business leaders at this time, are we, are we inclined to forget that fundamental responsibility and to minimize the scale of the challenge in, in just keeping it going? Well, I, let me go to your uh, your question. It's not soft work by any stretch of imagination. It's uh, it's a question that that a number of folks are asking, and I think will increasingly ask. Um, but just one clarification: for when you talk about consumers, I assume you're also talking about civil society, because it's critical that we remind ourselves that civil society are are really uh, absolutely. Uh, essential actors in this discussion, particularly as it relates to keeping us honest. And I think we'll probably talk about that as, as we go forward. So the there are two debates in business uh, around uh, what is the responsibility of business. The old outdated uh, view is that the responsibility, this is uh, Milton Friedman's view, is that the responsibility of business is to shareholders. Uh, increasingly, that is not 
the the view that that most business leaders uh, hold. Some still do, and some will no doubt hold. And there will be arguments uh, from that perspective. But it's very clear that the broader stakeholder community is what allows businesses to operate, particularly licensed to operate, which is your consumer point. And it's also important to recognize that, and and we'll talk about the finance sector, I'm guessing, in a little while. But ultimately. Uh, the, the transition to net zero is a business question. And the transition to net zero from a, a finance perspective is a capital allocation question. And so it is completely within our responsibility and wheelhouse to think about how we're gonna make this transition to net zero and to be building our businesses around it. And let's make no mistake about it. It's not just an energy question. Every single industry and businesses, including finance, will be impacted as we transition to net zero. And I, I, as we're preparing, and just to add one other sort of broader comment, people, uh, one question was, well, wait a minute, uh, CEOs, they're, uh, they're making 2050 commitments and they're not going to be in their jobs, and nor will the politicians be in their jobs in 2050. And therefore, it, it really doesn't, it doesn't, uh, apply to them. But let's be clear, to achieve the objective of limiting global temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees C, this is an eight-year problem. And frankly, it is probably a three to five-year problem, which is exactly in the wheelhouse of both politicians, but importantly, uh, business leaders. So this is as front and center uh, from a business and finance perspective as uh, as any question or problem that we have. And in fact, it is the most urgent in our time. Okay, so you've made a very compelling uh, case uh, that apart from anything else, self-interest should dictate um, taking climate change as a central urgent problem. Let me rephrase my original question then. Is it, is it reasonable to expect business leaders now in a time of climate crisis to uh, factor in more than self-interest, enlightened self-interest? Uh, you've, you've explained uh, the, the, the sort of evolution of the Milton Friedman position into, you know, from shareholders to stakeholders and, and now uh, an exist that it's an existential question for businesses and everybody. It has to be a habitable um, uh, planet after all. But I suppose what I'm getting at is, uh, is the fundamental goalpost still the same, namely um, enlightened self-interest? Well, I think uh, it's a very fair question. I guess I would say, uh, so, if I didn't want to answer the question, I would push back and say, because I am going to answer it, <laughs> I would push back and say, well, actually, be clear that the transition to net zero will be the most significant economic transition in history. It will be faster than the uh, technology revolution and deeper, more broader than the industrial revolution. This is a big deal, truly a big deal. And so business and finance should view this as an opportunity to build businesses, build robust businesses, and drive profitability and competitive position. And th that is true, fundamentally uh, true. It is also true that the, the role of, of stakeholders, and as you said, your third leg to consumers and license to operate, uh, reinforces that because failure to act, and, and I actually do agree that uh, it is easier to make a commitment than to fulfill it, uh, but we are going to be held accountable to fulfilling it. And if we're not, then uh, shame on all of us as consumers and as members of society. But lastly, and to your question, no, I categorically believe it is my moral and ethical responsibility to act. How can you not think that? And any business leader says that, oh, well, it's not really my responsibility. Uh, malarkey. It is absolutely my responsibility. And I feel a huge pressure to do everything I possibly can over the next three to five, 10 years to be part of the solution. And any business leader who doesn't think that is sadly mistaken. And how are you seeing that in your business and in uh, uh, businesses whose investments you manage? 
Well, first of all, our, our broader stakeholders, uh, Generation is, is, a, is a smaller firm. We're $40 billion of assets, and we're committed to sustainability, both from an investment perspective and an ad advocacy perspective. So all of our stakeholders expect and demand, and of course, uh, that's part of our, our DNA and our mission. But the broader investment community, who now represent $130 trillion, have all made this commitment to net zero. And there's an array of reasons to do so. And of course, the, the number is suspect. And uh, frankly, it's one thing to, again, to make a commitment and it's another thing to act. But the point of the matter is, when we started Generation 20 years ago, we weren't having these conversations. Five years ago, we weren't having these conversations. Perhaps even two years ago, we weren't. But we are today because people recognize all aspects of this question, from urgency to the transformation of, of economies and business trees, to license to operate, and in many cases, because it's the right thing to do. And so what I'm talking about isn't universally felt for sure, but it's increasingly, uh, I, I think, uh, regard or, or accepted as the right way to, to address these challenges, both from a business license to operate and moral perspective. Uh, David, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you one more thing in, in, uh, in a moment. And then afterwards, perhaps we could come to Peter, um, Viefkind, I've gone and lost the chat on the on the uh, on the iPad. This is going to be a problem. Uh, but um, <laughs> David, um, you mentioned the 130 trillion uh, figure. Should we take that seriously? You should absolutely take it seriously because uh, to make these commitments, particularly in uh, some of the banks, they recognize that they're they're right in the target area. They know exactly, or the big insurance companies. So they know that they've now uh, made a commitment that will absolutely be monitored and, and, uh, and pushed back on. People like Generation know exactly who made these commitments, and we won't forget it. The, the road to Glasgow is important, but the road from Glasgow is even more important. And monitoring and measuring and insisting upon urgent action is going to be the order of the day for all of us, which is why, again, I talked about civil society, as well as the activists outside. We need all of these voices to compel us to get to where we need to get to. And like, make no mistake, this is really hard. This is really hard. Even those of us who've been in this for a long time don't fully appreciate that cutting carbon emissions in half in eight years is a huge challenge, but that's what we've embarked on. Great, uh, thank you. So I'd, I'd love to come to Peter if I can, but, and, and then Rosemary, I'd like to come back to you to, uh, because you hear a lot about a change, not in the past uh, five years, but more recently than that, a sort of cultural change, change way of thinking in big companies. And I'd like to ask if, if you sort of have, have spotted that too, but um, hello, we had you there. Hi, you were making a point about being both a employee and a shareholder. Um, does that make you feel empowered? And exp explain exactly what the point was. Well, um, at Cat Gemini, we have a shareholder program for employees. And um, many people participate, so that makes us a factor of importance in the shareholder community. And I think it, in, that appeals to me also in the way that um, any decisions the company makes uh, with, regarding to, to uh, net zero plans, um, well, I have a, a vote there too in um, seeing if it's ambitious enough or in approving or disapproving. I know that my I have actually, I as an employee, I have two voices. I have the voice as an employee, I have the voice as a shareholder as well. And from a shareholder perspective, well, maybe it's just a, a more personal view. Uh, I tend to look more to the, uh, um, to a slightly more distant future to see how companies are acting and how viable they will be in 10, 20, 30 years. And any company not responding to current circumstances, in my view, uh, will, will not be there in a, in a couple of years. So that, that's also my view and how I would actually, um, where, where I would put my capital uh, in regard with my own personal finance budget. Are you a member of a climate circle? Um, I've applied for one, and it, it, it uh, hasn't been held yet at the, currently, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. And just one more question, which sort of may illuminate a little bit about 
corporate culture, and I'm, I'm a beginner on that, do you feel you're doing more listening on climate to leadership or, or talking? I mean, who, are, are you in a listening mode or, 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 or do you feel you're the one who is, uh, along with colleagues, exerting the pressure? I feel I'm more in a listening mode, although um, uh, in, on an interpersonal level with colleagues, um, I, I'm more in the, uh, uh, well, the, the personal sharing mode. Right. Um, like we, I've decided long ago that I'm, I'll be using public transport as, as much as I can also for, for work purposes. And uh, well, people know that of me. And, uh, and they, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a topic sometimes for conversation. So that's, that's the way that I, um, that, that's my pressurizing mode. Okay, well, I hope you get into that climate circle. Um, so Rosemary and, and Fiona as well, um, let, let's, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm very aware that the that people on the street uh, people who've been demonstrating last Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if they were in the room and maybe maybe you've got people who, from the demonstrations in the room, it'd be great to hear from you if, if you've been here, are uh, acutely attuned to greenwash. And, and uh, none of us want to be a party to that. We want to be a party to, to real change. But real change is what we hear has happened in boardrooms. Uh, how, very recently. Um, how recently and, and, and how have you sensed it? I think you're right. Um, we, as Capgem and I, have been working on, um, let's say, climate-related topics with our clients for more than a decade. Right. But the volume and intensity and deep integrity of our clients to address climate change, I would say, has dialed up significantly over the last few years. And perhaps when we first started to work with them, maybe 2010, um, even earlier than that, it was something that many companies were interested in and were investigating, but it wasn't a corporate or um, a society uh, urgency in the way it is now. And that, of course, is partly because we're not making the progress that we need to to right. um, achieve you know, the Paris Agreement. But it's also because of that groundswell of opinion. We, there's no excuse now for, for failing to understand the imperative we have. And that takes governments, citizens, protesters, businesses to work together to make this change. Because I, David made the point already, this is not an easy change for us to make. It really involves us taking yeah. responsibility for our own behaviours. And I think the other thing that's important is a comment that uh, Fiona made, which is about young generation voting with their feet. It's not just about their behaviours and their desire to change. It's also that they are our future labour market. Yeah. And in the economic situation we're in at the moment, where we probably have a shortage of skilled labour in many, many areas, yeah. understanding the, the strength and the integrity with which organizations are addressing climate change is one of the major things that make our young graduates determine who they're going to work for. I don't know if you find that too. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we see it as well when I speak to automakers, for example, mm. they're really struggling to hire great talent, you know, the young tech talent that they need because they don't want to be working for companies that are producing petrol and diesel vehicles because they're not, they're not doing good for the world, right? And, and I, I was fascinated by that because we actually have this amazing depth of talent at Octopus. It's such a pleasure to work with these young, purpose-driven, passionate individuals that really want to make a change. And of course, it was only when I was speaking to these other organizations, like, yeah, it's really hard for them to make the change because they can't get the people in the same way yeah but actually if you if you're truly living it i think to your point it's not it can't be greenwash because the young people they see through it they do their research and they see through it they want to work for people who are truly driving that change so i think that's really important we we also work with big clients so um we lease electric vehicles as an employee scheme so you can do it a bit like cycle to work you can do it out of your gross salary and so we specialize in that because it makes going electric for your transport, a no-brainer, absolute no-brainer. Now, what we found is 
uh, we, we saw a sevenfold increase in terms of inquiries in the space of like six months. And that was actually driven by the low company car tax rates. So that was the low benefit and kind rate. It went from like 16% for electric vehicles down to zero. All overnight, it just dropped. And the, the equivalence on petrol and diesel went the other way. And you couldn't even do it on salary sacrifice anyway. So we Wait had- Wait a minute, Fiona, which six months were these? So it was about a year and a half ago. And this right. is interesting because your point is, what about more recently? So actually at that point, this was just business sense. People, businesses wanted to make that switch to EVs because it was significantly cheaper than the petrol and diesel counterparts. In fact, the company car tax rate for petrol and diesel cars made it just really unattractive for employees generally. People were taking cash and they were looking at other ways to get, get around, uh, it, except in EVs. Now, so that was like a mechanism that got people interested and got people talking about it. But more recently, I think there's more strategic conversations and people are thinking about their net zero plans and they want to be brave and they want to be ambitious. And so transport is one part of that. And actually they're looking more broadly around energy supply, you know, around all the different bits of their supply chain as well and thinking about their broader net zero plans. And that's what we're seeing. And that includes charge points at the offices, switching over their bigger vans and their other vehicles as well. And so it's, it's a lot more of a strategic shift, I think, in the last six to 12 months rather than the 12 months that we saw before that. And, and I think it demonstrates also how changes in legislation from the government yeah. can really drive business really drive. and consumer behaviours. And to your point as well, when they start living it, yep. they realise it's quite fun. Like driving mm -hmm. an electric car is quite yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, like, you know, they get behind it. They find that it's cheaper to run it. It doesn't break down as much. It engages the kids. The kids love it as well. You know, there's so many different parts of it. Fiona, but... you're going to have to come back tomorrow at, <laughs> at 8.30. Actually, today at Eurocentral, my team are test driving electric cars outside Glasgow. For those of you that are in the area, if you've not driven one, uh, you can. And then we're actually up in Aberdeen and... Dundee as well later on in the week because we're doing a bit of a Scottish road show because when people get into the vehicles they just they, their minds are blown they just can't believe they're so good we they, they are fun and look this is your opportunity actually to plug salary sacrifice as, as an example of, of corporate leadership on this yeah absolutely so uh, salary sacrifice you can do it at your grace salary you can save 30 to 40 percent every month on your electric vehicle even before fuel savings, it makes it cheaper than the petrol diesel equivalent. Uh, we actually come in and we, this is another part, right? It's a highly visible commitment to the environment and commitment to your people. And we come in with electric vehicles to your offices and enable your, your employees to test drive the cars, to talk about that transition to net zero, to think about how they might charge it, where the energy comes from, what, what are they filling their cars up with today? Where does that come from? And we kind of explore it all. And we can even do days around it in terms of net zero days. And it becomes a kind of anchor for that conversation. Yeah, I, th I think to do that, you also need to have the will to want to change. At Capgemini, we're um, moving entirely to an EV and a hybrid um, car scheme. And it has not been without some reluctance from some of our employees who are in the traditional set, uh, sense petrol heads. You know, the, the leadership in the company has taken the decision. We've got our carbon neutral and our net zero path. We have to drive some change from within. And this is one of the things we can do. And I, I think having your B2B customers yeah. adopt that really helps you progress with the, um, you know, the approach that you're mentioning. Yeah. So it's a combination of business, those individuals as employees wanting to adopt the new technologies yeah. and having um, the right financial incentives in place. Thank you. I, I want to come to Catherine Simmons, uh, a loyal Tortoise member, if we can. And then I want to come back to you guys. Uh, we've been talking a lot about um, business leadership and employees <laughs> and consumers and civil society. I want, while we still have time, to talk a bit about... Uh, actually, I want to hear from you guys. If there, uh, I, We do... We, OK, excellent. I see some hands up. We'll come to you in a second. Um, uh, about business leaders and, and government but C Catherine hello um hello again nice to see you again um uh you say in the chat I don't think uh individual change is enough but perhaps without it nothing will happen um okay mm -hmm. but where, where does where do business leaders uh, come into that what what is their what do you see as 
business leaders responsibilities in terms of listening to those like you who were on the streets on Saturday? Um, yes, I was on the streets on Saturday. Having said that, I think there were quite a lot of people who um, might have been in the blue zone as well uh, who came along on Saturday. It was a, it was a very carnivalesque sort of march. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I do think as business leaders, you're in a really difficult position because you're you're pushed between the, the need to make a profit and the sort of due diligence or the, um, the, the duty you have to your shareholders and investors. But Catherine, unless, you, but, sorry, sorry to interrupt, unless you, you accept the fundamental thesis from Fiona that this is a business opportunity. Um, yeah, I, and I, I think that for many businesses, I think there are opportunities, but I do think that's a little overrated for a lot. Um, I mean, businesses like Capgemini and Octopus, and I love you guys, by the way, I am a customer. Um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot that you can do, um, but for many businesses, there isn't, and there is that kind of tension for them. But I think I think you are also human, and, you, you, and what Rosemary said at the beginning about uh, walking the talk about about leading by doing, I think is is so important to you know to see visible business and um, political leaders leading on that on the sort of the more individual choices that I think we need to make um, is 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 a absolutely vital thing, and I think that's what I meant when I said that I do, I don't I don't think we can all just kind of eat less meat and ride our bicycles and everything will be okay because there is a need for some systemic change and there's a feedback loop between what I do and what's um, available for me to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, drive an electric car, but I can only do that if there are charging points around you know, everywhere and that kind of, of thing. Um, so, you know, I, th I think the thing that business leaders can do is what, you two are doing um, and making it um, very visible that there are changes that can be made and enabling them. Um, probably that's a, that's a really too. key point. Uh, the feet, Just, it, yeah, go ahead. Can I pick up one of well, I do want to come to these people in the room. So. And it's delighted you're a customer. Thank you. Uh, the, <laughs> there, was a, there was a point there around the shareholder value and what's right. And actually it might be an interesting conversation to have with your VW contacts tomorrow as well. At this point in time, car manufacturers are making more money on their petrol and diesel cars than they are on an electric car. It's more expensive to make and they don't make the same amount of returns. And so it's estimated Bloomberg New Energy Finance think that will switch in Europe in 2026, okay. but only if the car manufacturers have invested in purely electric manufacturing so they can't have a have a um manufacturing line that can make petrol and diesel cars and they're also making some electrics they need to have pure electric vehicle manufacturing and so that means it's still like another four and a half five years until they start making more money from evs now they are expected at the minute by their shareholders to be making financial returns if i was in that business my job would be to be optimizing financial returns for that business. Yeah. So it's a really difficult position right now where they're like, okay, well, we want, you know, even if they're sitting there and they want to do the right thing for the climate and for the, for the planet, how do they start to invest in that as much as they possibly can, but also be optimizing financial returns? Now, I think it's switched now. And the, mm. the automotive market's gone enough that way. And you've seen a lot of announcements in the last 12 months from a lot of different manufacturers making that commitment. And you can see them now trying to scale up that manufacturing. But I'm sure it's true in other places still. And it's still not clear to me if some of them are still holding on to trying to sell ICE vehicles, uh, internal combustion yeah. engine vehicles, for as long as possible, because that's where they're making more money. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll reach a tipping point, I hope. Um, we had a hand on the right. Do you have a microphone, sir? Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Antonio. I work for CR Global. We're a fund that invests in European companies for the past 25 years, and we just launched a climate fund. As I engage with companies, I think the key is building credibility. So in your, as, uh, in your role in your companies and in like expecting other companies also to behave, how are you thinking about setting, I mean, you already set the baseline, communicating the baseline, and communicating the execution of the decarbonization path how are you thinking about this auditing in that sense? Because in three years, things can go wrong. Like this year, we saw it in the market. Hey, supply chain was an issue. We couldn't get the things. We have to postpone it next year. 
how you, because what you see on the streets, this blah, 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 it's execution. So how are you guaranteeing that execution is flawless, seamless, and communicated to the public? Okay, so what I want to do to uh, hold that thought, Rosemary, we'll come to you in a second. Uh, we've got a hand up here and we'll try and respond to uh, Barney. There we go. And yes, sir, you behind. Let, let. Hi, my name is Paul Fintel. I'm one of the co-founders of The Conduit. Um, I, I wanted to put you three kinds of leadership and, and get your reflections because it's, Having spent some time at COP, I've seen all three in evidence. Um, the first is, I think, and all in the context of net zero, is a sort of lazy leadership, I would suggest, which gets to net zero just by buying offsets. You, mm -hmm. you continue business as usual and you buy offsets and you sort of just take a little bit of money from your profits in order to <laughs> mitigate uh, the, the, the impact of climate. The second is a little more incremental, and that's looking at how you achieve efficiencies. And there's just thousands of examples abound from adjusting lighting levels in offices to preventing um, uh, wastage of electricity in grids to stopping leaks in pipes. All of these very small, nudgy kind of incremental changes can, am can amount to an enormous amount of emission saving. And that's a sort of interesting and attentive form of leadership, but it's sort of incremental. And I think the thirdest and perhaps the hardest is ones where your business model itself is heavily emitting and rather profitable. And you're trying to think about how you uh, steer and pivot your business away from something that is profitable and comfortable and shareholder friendly, as it were, in some narrow sense of what shareholder friendly is but requires a kind of deep transformation in what you're trying to do. And I think that takes a step change in, in different kinds of leadership. Um, and it's a much more difficult one to try and manage. And I'd love you to reflect on whether you think that those three models apply or are useful in thinking about what the responsibility of leaders are. What, what useful word do you have for that third one? We had lazy, <laughs> we had attentive, what was the third? I mean, I think you have to be courageous and transformational. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Shall we, if we can hold our responses, I want, to, I want to make sure we come to the gentleman at the back first, and then we'll, we'll have time to hear from everybody before we close. Hi. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Can you tell us your name, what, sir? Uh, my name is Kishan. I'm from Wipro. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One to, one to Rosemary and other to David. Uh, Rosemary, to you, uh, when you transition from uh, you know the car allowance to the EV and hybrid leasing, what sort of a financial impact? I mean, material financial impact it had on your uh, you know margins and stuff, and what sort of a deliberation the XCOM and the board went through before you arrived at the at that decision? And the second question is to David. Uh, you spoke about one thirty trillion in asset management, asset under management. <coughs> The industry is all about, you know, it's a 300 to 350 trillion dollar industry. Is it really compelling? Because it is less than 50% uh, under asset under management that we're talking about from climate finance. And that to, uh, you know, to 2030. So did we do enough commitment on that? Just an honest opinion or is it just a makeshift numbers for all the buy side, sell side coming together and just, you know, making that uh, <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I do see uh, a, a hand there, but I want to give everyone a chance to respond. Rosemary, there's um, there've been a, a lot of uh, questions for you. The first one from Antonio was on how do you execute? How do you show people that you're doing what you say you're going to do? I think it's like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's like every other strategy to plan to results. You have to take your high level objective. You break it down into the tangible steps. In Camp Gemini, we deliver a sustainability report every year that talks about what we've achieved, what we expect to achieve over the next period. We measure against our targets and we publish the results. Easy to do in principle, um, but much more difficult to do in practice because coming to, to Paul's point, I think we need to see all three kinds of leadership personally 
I think carbon offsets are a useful tool in the journey to help our climate, but I think they are, I think they are only one um, step along that journey. They can help us achieve short or medium term improvement, but they are not the solution for climate change. They are a way of offsetting it. And to really make progress with climate change from a business leadership or a society perspective, we have to make change happen. We have to transform, we have to take that courageous leadership, and we really have to change some things at source, as opposed to making no change happening happen and attempt to offset it. So those uh, fundamental ground up small changes that, as you correctly say, can really add up to a big change, we need those to continue. Yes, offsetting can help us in the short term, but without real change in large companies to address the consumer and the government agenda about this working together, um, we won't make the change that is needed. And I think the kind of business opportunity and change that Fiona has been talking about today really demonstrates that. Probably 15 years ago, the very idea of the government helping promote EVs in a positive way and corporations helping push their employees to make those decisions People would have laughed at that, and it is now active reality. Yeah, and that's things. what fundamental changes, I believe. Yeah. I, I want to come to David um, before we run out of time because there was a question specifically about uh, did we do enough on the finance, David? If you're still there, and then I, I have a follow up about about business and government. So, so <clears throat> uh, in, in terms of the the, the final question, uh, the the investment management industry is a hundred trillion dollar industry more or less uh, 57 trillion signed up to it it's called 50 percent so no we we actually think that 50 percent number is a pretty significant one and we expect that that number will grow over the course of the next year or so uh, frankly if you haven't signed up your license to operate is impaired and whether uh, one other quick comment uh, around lazy incremental transformational we strongly agree that transformational is the only way to get to net zero um and david we talked a lot about uh business leadership and employees stakeholders shareholders consumers what about business leadership and government especially in jurisdictions where regulation is lagging we see all over the world businesses crying out for a level playing field but a more demanding one in climate terms if you're a CEO, isn't your time best spent um, nobbling, as we say in England, the key politicians? Well, I think it would be uh, naive to say that we can get to net zero without a significant uh, contribution and leadership from from our political leaders and for a long while we we tried to ignore the political leaders because we we're very frustrated with them certainly 10 15 years ago our, our hope is that they are beginning to recognize the urgency uh, of action and uh, i think that the whole question of lobbying etc is a, is a dangerous one but i think as business leaders we can very publicly say that we expect our political leaders to act Thank you so much. Fiona, I, I wanted to invite you to come back on that because I, I know that the regulatory environment is absolutely key to your, your business success. How much time do you spend nobbling politicians? <laughs> Good question. Uh, we, do, we do engage with politicians, but we like to kind of um, demonstrate by doing. So we get out there with things like smart energy tariffs. We get out there with, uh, you know, a new way of discovering electric vehicles. We get out there with uh, demonstrating new heat pumps and that kind of stuff. So across the business, we are getting out there demonstrating that it can be done so that they have the confidence to put the regulatory framework in place to encourage everyone to be able to do it. Because unless there are people doing, <laughs> then there's a nervousness that will it come? Is it actually possible? But we show that it's possible so that they can have the confidence to really get behind it too. And uh, picking up on the transformational point, I absolutely, you know, obviously completely agree with that transformational part first. Uh, Rosemary, we're nearly out of time. Um, you, you've spoken a lot about the need to lead by doing, to lead by example. We're in a bubble here. Uh, in a few days, we'll be out of the bubble. We'll be back to our normal lives. Climate will have taken its pre-COP place, more or less, in our order of priorities. But what, as a senior executive, did just 
suggest one thing that perhaps five years hence, um, one way in which your daily professional life will have changed uh, as a result of this? As a result of COP26? Or yes, as a result all, all, of the all the promises we've made to each other, to the, to the wider world, in, how will that translate into the, 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 your daily life at work? I, I think there are several ways. First of all, I think we will have a way of demonstrating to clients exactly what the carbon effect of a project that we're going to do with them will be, how this will help them to get towards their targets and you know, the effect of this piece of work on what they're trying to achieve. I'm really confident that that target, uh, carbon, let's say measurement of the, the kind of consulting or change or um, technology work we do will be considered de facto standard by then. I also think, just to Catherine's point earlier on about some organizations not being able to change, I actually feel that every organization can do something to address the climate change. It might be redesigning a product, it might be using a different kind of material. As we've been discussing, it might be a new kind of business model completely. But I think ultimately it's not about the organizations that can and cannot change. It's about how much are they prepared to transform their businesses to address this issue. And no business, and certainly not humanity, wants to have its Kodak moment. And I think the key thing here is about the urgency with which that will happen unless we can get our emissions down to 1.5% 1, 1. Um, uh, increase, you know, compared to where we wanted to be pre-industrial revolution. And one of the things that I think has been important in this COP is recognising that we need to make faster progress on it. So the acceleration is there. I genuinely think that businesses, individuals, protesters, governments, we're all human beings, and it really has dialed up the urgency on moving on it. Thank you very much. I'm aware that we're a couple of minutes over. Um, I'd just like to pick out a few things from all the scribbling that I've done. One of them is the Kodak moment notion. I, I hadn't come across that invert, neat inversion uh, of the, the Kodak example, um, but I think it is very pertinent to the original question what is required of, of, of business leaders is to avoid the, the Kodak trap. Um, uh, David mentioned early on the shareholder uh, focused view as being outdated and stakeholders and many others are, are now a key constituency that business leaders need to be uh, attuned to. Um, I think it was really helpful. Uh, thank you, Paul, just now those uh, three uh, leaderships. I think everybody was nodding and scribbling. Uh, lazy, attentive, and courageous. Um, and it's interesting that you had the courage to point out that that component of lazy might, might actually, that the offsetting component might actually be essential to many businesses in transition. It's a controversial subject, but uh, many national and business uh, net zero plans depend on it, at least as a, as a sort of transitional tool. Necessary, but not sufficient. Necessary, but not sufficient. Um, thank you for reminding us of the 1.5 degree goal. If we don't keep that in mind, we are almost literally fried. And uh, of, of the point that the younger generation, uh, who are the ones who uh, need to see this example, are the future's labour market, and we're all human. So a lot to digest, a lot for business leaders to do. Thank you very much for joining us and do join us again um, tomorrow for the session that has been quite heavily trailed in this one on, on electric vehicles at 8.30 here. But in the meantime, David, Blood, thank you very much for uh, joining us remotely. Fiona, Rosemary, and everyone in the room, thanks again. <laughs>